Okay, so I, I think I'm going to start because this is a new unit and um, there's a lot to do. <laughs> um, uh, hold on a minute. <laughs> so this is a new unit. It's on thermodynamics. <clears throat> And we studied thermodynamics, or at least whoever you took Chem 103 with um, must have done it a bit of thermodynamics because it's in the, you know, you do enthalpy and things like that. But in this unit, we get a little further with thermodynamics, um, which scares a lot of students. But honestly, um, the way I think it is, is is it's a little hard to explain some of these things. And I try really hard to make it very clear because this is actually one of my fields that I teach advanced courses in. But, um, but in a way, it's actually easier to do the problems than it is to do the explaining uh, that leads to the doing of the problem. So I don't think you should get scared about this stuff. And um, I think that while you may not even follow everything perfectly with the theory, when it comes to doing the problems, they're very, I think they're pretty straightforward. And we've done a lot more difficult things this semester, I think, than this. So um, let's just get going with it. And, um, and what I start with is I do a little review of the first law because I don't know what anybody learned about the first law of thermodynamics. I call it the first law of TD. Um, the first law of thermodynamics is very closely related to the concept of conservation of energy. Um, and you know what that is, that's about, that's the fact that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, and and the, the, um, the statement of the first law is a little bit, I would call it a little cryptic <laughs> at best, <laughs> which, which means it's, it's a little coded, it's a little, um, you know, it's not obvious what it means. Delta E equals Q plus W. Okay, so this is the first law, but um, it really does require a little bit of explanation. Okay, um, the statement of it in words. So this is this is what it would be in like an equation form, but in words, um, it 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 says it's not much better. It says <laughs> any change. <laughs> in the system's energy, which we refer to as delta E, is, is either due to heat going into that system or out of it. So it's due to heat going in or out of the system or work done on or by the system. Okay, so like I said, it, it, it has to do with the energy of the system and it has to do with heat going in or out of the system and work the system might do, but um, it's not so clear how all this, what all this means and, and, and what is even a system. So for us, the system really, you know, this is a chemistry course. So the system is really the reacting chemicals. It doesn't always have to be a reaction. You could have a phase change. So um, whatever chemicals are involved with that. And, um, and, and you might add, you know, since this is referring to changes in energy to the system due to heat going in or out of the system, you, you really should ask the question, you know, where does the heat go if it leaves the system? And where does the heat come from if it goes, if it enters the system? Does anybody know the answer to that? What do we call the rest 
of the world, the universe. We have our system and we have everything else. That's right. It's the surroundings. So if heat is going away from the system, it's going to the surroundings. So that's the answer to this question, to the surroundings. And where is it coming from? It's coming from the surroundings. So the surroundings is really everything but the system, right? So if you have if your system is reacting chemicals, so let, let's just write system is the reacting chemicals. I mean, literally the molecules that are reacting or the atoms, the surroundings is like the beaker. You know, if it's in solution, it uh, the solvent, right? That could would be part of the surroundings. So a lot of times, you know, the water that's dissolving the ions, let's say if you have an ionic reaction, the water would be part of the surroundings. Um, the atmosphere, the top of the bench. Do we care about, you know, the, um, the building across the street? No, do we care about the moon? No, I mean, they're all part of the surroundings, but what we really care about is, you know, the immediate surroundings. It's really um, what, what we deal with. Um, so suppose we have an exothermic reaction, okay? So let's suppose that a reaction is exothermic, right? What does that mean, exothermic? This is something that we use all the time. Okay, exothermic means it releases heat, right? Okay, did somebody answer that? <laughs> All right, so that means it releases heat. So um, how do we know that a reaction releases heat? So, so how can we tell that, um, that a reaction is exothermic? What, what would we see? What would be the um, characteristics of such a reaction that we could see if we were in a laboratory doing this experiment. Would that be like when it comes to like boiling and stuff like that? Well, a boiling isn't technically a reaction, right? Um, um, but, uh, but, and boiling doesn't release heat. Boiling actually requires heat. So boiling is endothermic and we're putting heat in, right? But if a reaction just happens by itself, and if reaction just releases heat, then we will, somebody said the surrounding increases in heat. So the, the evidence for releasing heat, so the evidence that a reaction is exothermic is that um, it releases heat, right? So it feels hot, you know, the beaker feels hot. The system is releasing that heat into the surroundings. So the surroundings, as somebody said, uh, surroundings gets hot. Who said that? That was right. I think. Good. All right. Um, and I also got another great answer. And it says that the delta H is lower for the products. And um, somebody said smoke, uh, bubble, smoke, steam. Um, I think you can have a, an, uh, you could have a reaction that was actually endothermic that produced bubbles. I wouldn't say that bubbles is, um, but, but definitely heat. Okay. So, so the thing is, um, and this speaks to what Ashley commented on that the Delta H is lower for the product. So if a reaction is exothermic, it tells us something, and we know that because we have this evidence here. It tells us something important. And what it tells us is that indeed it started out at a higher energy and ends it up at a lower energy, that the reactants are higher in energy than the products. The products are more stable. 
So if the reaction released heat, it's because the system went from a higher energy to a lower energy. And where did that energy go? Energy is not created or destroyed. It just goes different places. It left the system as heat. That's what this sort of weird diagram means. Heat leaves the system, goes into the surroundings, okay? And it tells us the very fact that we feel this heat tells us that, that the products are lower in energy than the reactants. Um, another th what thing, by the way, it feels hot, surroundings gets hot, and uh, you could have a thermometer in the surroundings and its temperature goes up. So that's another thing that we're gonna use in lab actually when we do it next week. Um, okay, so it tells us that the system got down to a lower energy, okay? And it released heat. And now we come to the first law. So the first law is in a sense, it's a way to keep track of the change in energy. It tells us what we have to look at, okay? Um, let's see. So since the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants, right? We see that in the diagram here. There are basically two ways that this energy can be transferred to the surroundings. And one is the one I wrote above, and that is by transferring heat. But there's another thing, and that is, and that is that work can be done. So for example, if you have an internal combustion engine and you have a reaction of basically gasoline, which is a bunch of different molecules, but let's say, let's call it hexane just for the, you know, that hexane combusts, produces carbon dioxide and water, releases a lot of heat. And some of that heat goes into moving the car, right? It pushes those pistons, which drive the, you know, I don't know all the parts of the car, the, you know, camshaft or something like that. But anyway, um, if, if this is a reaction in an engine, then work is done. The car moves. And this is a big part of chemistry uh, and it's a very important thing. But at this stage, we like to ignore the work, okay? Um, and, and, and we do that by, by using, so we use a sort of simplified form of the first law. And we do this so that we don't have to worry about this, this work at least not yet. So um, we use this, we say that the change in enthalpy is equal to the heat, okay? And whereas delta E, the change in energy is equal to the heat plus the work, we wanna get rid of the work. And so we use this as our um, sort of, uh, it's like the chemist's first law for beginners. And then when you get more advanced, you can do more. So let me talk about this a little bit, okay? First of all, um, and, I, and I, should, I should put this in, this is really very important and I'm gonna put it in right in here. I, I wanna have a little aside that says, um, what causes the end, the, the energy of the system to be higher or lower after a chemis chemical reaction. So what causes the energy of the system to change? You know, so during a reaction, what is it about a reaction that causes the energy of the system to change? And I, I know I've talked about this, I've definitely referred to it many times, but there is, Certain, there are certain things that require energy when you have a chemical reaction and certain things that release energy. 
And does anybody kind of know what I'm talking about here? Because what changes when you have a chemical reaction? In a chemical reaction, you have the formation of new substances from old substances, okay? You get, basically you have bonds are broken and made. When you break bonds, that requires energy. Because bonds stabilize molecules. When you form bonds, it releases energy in general. And there are some very important and notable exceptions to this, which I'm not going to talk about today. But anyway, breaking bonds requires energy. Forming bonds releases energy. So more bonds and or more stronger bonds, so stronger and or more bonds at the end of a reaction would mean the energy is lower. Fewer and or weaker bonds would mean the energy is higher. So this is what, this results in a delta E for a reaction, okay? Now, um, getting back to our first law here, okay? We, we calculate the delta H for a reaction and we, we take that to be, you know, due to the, the difference in the, you know, basically the, the bonds that were formed and the bonds that were broken. And, and we can simplify the second, this is the first law, we simplify it to get this delta H expression. And let me talk about this delta H. So delta H, this is called the change in enthalpy. And the entire reason that we use the word enthalpy instead of using the word energy is so that we don't have to worry about the work. We really don't wanna do that at this stage of our chemistry um, education, okay? And if we make a little, you know, this is, uh, thermodynamics is all about all like under this, this condition, this happens, under that condition, this happens. Well, when the conditions, I'm gonna put a little P here. This means constant pressure. When reactions happen at constant pressure, the amount of heat that transfers, so QP, that's the heat that transfers when the pressure is constant, is equal to the delta H. So in gen chem, you know, we don't worry too much about the P. Most of our reactions occur on a bench top where the pressure is always atmospheric pressure. It's always constant. The change in enthalpy, this is due to bonds breaking and forming. And because of this breaking and forming of bonds, we end up with either an energy that's lower or higher than what we started with. And this energy is either released as heat or heat taken in, okay? Either, you know, whichever is true. So as long as we say at constant pressure, which I don't say more than once, this is basically the only time I'm going to say it, we can use delta H instead of delta E and we don't have to worry about the work. So for us, for today at least, and you know, we, um, we, we say that the heat that flows to or from the system to or from the system, and of course that would be to or from, it would go to the surroundings, um, is equal to the change in enthalpy, which is due to those bonds breaking and bonds forming. So I, I hope that that's somewhat clear. <laughs> um, and of course, you know that if you start with a higher energy and you go to a lower energy, okay, this is now enthalpy here. I, I use enthalpy and energy more or less interchangeably in general chem. You take PCHEM with me, I start being very specific about what I'm talking about. But here, 
I call it all, this is H or E as far as I'm concerned. Here's reactants, here's products. If the products are more stable, that means it has more uh, or stronger bonds than, energy, than heat is released. That's what happens in an exothermic reaction. On the other hand, okay, we have if, if we have an endothermic reaction, then the products are higher in energy or higher in enthalpy. Heat goes into the system in order for that um, system be able to get up to that higher energy, it needs the input of energy. Okay, so that, that summarizes really the first law and what we've done, you know, what you, you know, some of the ideas behind the enthalpy unit that you did in the uh, first uh, semester. And then, you know, you know how to calculate delta H's from delta HF zeros. We'll go over that again. Um, because we'll be using very similar type of thing. We'll be using the same thing when we calculate delta H's, which we do in this unit as well. Um, but we go a lot further in this unit, okay? So in unit seven, we really, um, you know, we take a sort of a bit of a leap from where we were. And we talk about when will a reaction happen on its own? spontaneously with no outside influence. So unit seven allows us to predict when a reaction will happen spontaneously. And what I mean really is when it will allow us to predict when a reaction will happen and won't <laughs> happen spontaneously. And again, this by spontaneously means really on its own by itself. Okay, so what unit seven really deals with is spontaneity, which has a bit of a different definition, you know, in chemistry than it does in, in, in everyday life, okay? Spontaneity for us, oh, it's when you do something fun or you just thought of it, so you do it. Well, a chemical reaction has a very specific meaning. Spontaneous means happens on its own. And the second law of thermodynamics deals with spontaneity. In fact, this is what the second law says. So I'm gonna tell you the second law and there's clearly a word in the second law that we have not talked about. That word is entropy, but then I will talk about entropy. Okay, so what the second law says is that is for a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe, pretty lofty, you know, pretty snobby, right? The entropy of the universe must increase. Well, as a, and there's a, and we use the symbol S for entropy. Um, if the entropy of the universe, so we call that the, the entropy of the universe must increase. It means the total entropy. That's what means the entropy of the universe means the total entropy must increase, which would mean that the change, the total change in entropy, which we give the symbol delta S total, has to be greater than zero for a spontaneous process. So if we have a chemical reaction and we are able to figure out that the change in total entropy um, is, is positive, then we could say, at least under the conditions where we, you know, we call it standard conditions, which is how we calculate it, 
so it's only for those conditions, we could say that under those conditions, that reaction would happen spontaneously. Okay, so I've made this whole second law, but I haven't told you what entropy is. And now I need to talk a bit about what entropy is. Now, when, you know, this is a, also a word in common in the English language. Well, it scared the heck out of my laptop though. It really, uh, what the heck was that about? Okay, sorry about that. So what comes to mind when you think of entropy? I mean, um, what word that we we have talked about a bit, but not a ton. So entropy is like what? Anybody? It is a, nature, that's true. Um, that's not quite the word I'm looking for, but um, <laughs> what is it about entropy? What do people say about entropy? This, the, the, yeah, these, some of these are good ones. Dispersion, dispersion of heat, um, energy, dispersal would be part of it. But I'm looking for a particular word. No one's given it to me. I thought I was going to get this right away. Okay, entropy we associate with disorder. Okay, so the that we say, oh, things tend to higher entropy. We mean that things get messier, right? Uh, I talk about the entropy of mixing. I say if you have you know, a little bit of red food coloring and you put it in a, a, a container of water that the natural tendency to mix the entropy factor will cause that red dye to disperse all over the solution even if you don't mix it, it's just gonna happen. So, so disorder is something that um, we associate with entropy. Um, and it's actually an excellent word for entropy. So a greater disorder means greater entropy. Um, so I, when I talk about disorder and entropy, I sort of talk about two types of disorder <laughs> or entropy. Um, one of them is, is heat dissipation. It's spreading heat around. And so I call this heat dissipation. So, you know, if you have a, a go to, you know, a campfire and you, you know, build this nice fire up, you know, what happens is, is that, that, that heat, you know, keeps going away, keeps spreading around, spreading around. You have to keep adding more wood to the fire, right? Um, it doesn't just stay there, right? So, so basically um, heat tends to dissipate. That's one thing. And, and that's one type of entropy or disorder. The, and another type has to do with the arrangements of particles. So it has to do with arrangements of particles or even objects. And, um, and I have a couple of, of handouts, a couple of pages of a handout that um, kind of illustrate what the types of processes that dissipate heat and, 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 where, and, and where the number of arrangements also comes to play. So let me go to the first one that I have here. So I call this handout, you know, free energy and thermodynamics blah, 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 entropy and disorder. So this is where I talk about how there are two kinds of disorder that are related to entropy. And a very, 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 very important one is the dissipation of heat. Let's talk about that first. So here I have a picture, basically kind of a fish tank and it has water in it and the water is cold. So no fish in it, they would die and the brick is hot. So, so, so what I'm trying to illustrate with these examples is how um, is is what happens spontaneously, and try to relate that to whether entropy is increasing or decreasing. So we know what happens when you put a brick in cool water. We know what happens to the heat. In fact, if I ask you to choose 
from A or B when you put a brick in cool water, hot brick in cool water, which way does the heat flow? Does the heat flow from the hot brick to the cool water so that eventually everything is the same temperature and that heat from the brick has dissipated? Or does heat flow from the cool water? I mean, the cool water has heat. It could flow to the brick, but it doesn't. The brick doesn't get hotter and the water get colder. This never happens. And this always happens. This happens spontaneously. So this is what happens, okay? The spontaneous direction dissipates heat, okay? Okay, greater, because we know that heat dissipation is one of the forms of energy. So greater heat dissipation means greater entropy, okay? So in this example, when we have heat dissipation happening, Entropy has gone up. Because we dissipated heat. Okay, so that's the first example. All right. Next example has to do with what happens when you open up when you if you turn off your refrigerator. So it says turn or unplug the refrigerator. And open it up. Open the door. Okay, so, so right after you do that, it's cooler inside, right? And it's hotter out here. So my question is, does heat flow out of the colder fridge and into the warmer room? Or does heat flow out of the warm room and into the cooler fridge? So which way does the heat go? Which of these happens? Well, you know, if uh, if heat um, flowed out of the cold fridge into the warmer room without it needing to be plugged in, then no one would buy a refrigerator. Okay. What happens is the second one, right? Heat flows from the um, warm room into the cooler fridge. Eventually, that fridge is not cool anymore. Heat has been spread around. Okay, so um, so here's a question, a very interesting question: Does heat ever get more concentrated? You know, if you have a room and you have a radiator in one corner of the room, and even if you turn that radiator off and it's hot, but you turn it off, so it's not generating more heat. Does that radiator ever get hotter just sitting there without more, uh, you know, if you turn it off? No, no, that's not what happens. Things tend to get to the same temperature. So, so why is it that you have this direction of the flow? And, and so I think you need to think about what heat is, you know? What's going on is that this heat is manifested the way it shows itself or the way it, what it is really is the moving molecules. Okay, so you've got moving molecules. You have to realize that moving molecules have heat. And the hotter they are, what happens if they're hotter? Do they move faster or do they move slower? They move faster. So you've got, let's say, molecules of air inside this fridge and outside this fridge. And then right after you open the door, you kind of have this, this um, interface, this place, the space between where you have the cool air on one side and the hotter air on the other side. So you've got these hot molecules next to these cold molecules. And what characterizes this situation is that the hot molecules are moving faster. 
and the cold molecules are moving slower. So what is going to happen? Are those sluggish slow molecules all gonna jostle the hotter ones and make them move faster? No, the hotter ones are moving faster. They will jostle the cooler ones and make them and make the cooler ones move faster. So what has this effectively done, right? Effectively, this heats up the cooler ones. And because the hotter ones have transferred some of their energy to the cooler ones, it slows down the hotter ones until eventually everything is at the same temperature. But it's more likely that the hot ones are going to jostle the cool ones and heat and get them moving faster than it is that the slow ones could jostle the hot ones. So I would say, you know, that the reason heat flows from a hot to cold is probability. It's just simply more likely that hot molecules will push cooler ones, making them go faster than the other way around. So I think if you understand that temperature, which is how we say something is hot or something is cold, has to do with its temperature. I think if you understand that temperature has to do with the motion energy of molecules, then this makes perfect sense, that the um, faster moving molecules at the higher temperature will jostle the slower, cooler ones and make the temperature all be the same at the end and will spread the heat around. So. I would simply say that it is more likely the reason heat flows from hot to cold is simply a probability thing. So um, the reason that heat flows from hot to cold, it's just a probability thing, probability. So how do you feel about that? Am I getting through to you here? Do you get it? Do you understand that? Um, all right. Uh, I haven't seen any comments to the effect, but uh, but it'd be nice to see a few. Okay, so that is the deal about heat. Yes, sir. yes. Can I just ask one question? Yeah, please. So what about if you're in a warm room and you have a glass table, the table is always colder than the room. Oh God, you know, I don't want to answer that question. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I think that has to do with other things like the heat capacity of the air and the glass. And I think eventually, wouldn't it be the same temperature? I don't know. That is a really good question, but I, 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 I can't stop and think about that now. I'll, I'll look, try to look that up for you. How's that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Who was I talking to anyway? Haley. Oh, Haley. Okay, good. Right. Oh, good question. Too good for me today. All right. So anyway, now I'd like to talk about arrangement of objects or particles. Okay, because this is another way of thinking about entropy, which I can't seem to highlight it. There we go. Okay. So here's a kind of cute example. Okay, let's say we have two samples of a gas and we're, it's connected by a valve and the valve is open. And on the left, we have a whole bunch, you know, we have more gas molecules here on the left. And less, fewer gas molecules on the right. So there's the two choices here. After a while, the number of gas molecules will become approximately the same on both sides, okay? 
got me thinking about that question now. So I'm really like, okay. Or after a while, will you end up with no gas on one side and all the gas on the other side? <laughs> and well, so what's the answer to this? Which of these is more likely? So how, how would you think of thinking about this problem? Uh, anybody? A, A was which? Yes, approximately the same on both sides. I would agree with that. I definitely would agree with that. Um, let me see something. Yeesh. Oh, there it goes. Good. Right. But why? Okay. So, so, um, yeah, what do you think that has to do with? Um, well, let's suppose that there's nothing actually in this, in this container, except for the gas. So the only pressure is being caused by that gas itself. I, I th think that there's actually two ways of looking at it. Um, you know, first of all, we know that gas molecules move at random, right? Um, and, and so there'd be random motion in all directions. But since you have more molecules on the left, there's going to be more net motion left to right than right to left. Okay, so eventually you they you would have you would get equal amounts on both sides. But there's another very interesting way of looking at it. It's a little tougher to think about. Mm -hmm. Suppose we think about how many ways you could arrange these particles. Let's think about how many ways you can arrange these molecules so that all of them are on one side. And what I mean by ways to arrange is, OK, um, if they're all on one side, then there's really only one way to do that. And that is putting all of them on one side. But let's suppose I even just put one on the right. OK, so I'll put one here and all the rest over here. How many ways are there to do that? Well, let's suppose I have 100 particles. How many ways are there where I could put just one particle on the right and 99 on the left? How many ways would there be of doing that? Well, I could take my first particle and put it here on the right, or I could put that particle back and put the second particle on the right. Let's label the particles one to 100. Then how many ways would there be of, of, of having just one particle on the right? 100, that's right, there would be 100 ways. Here there's one way, <laughs> okay? So already you can see there was just one particle on the right. There's a hundred ways you can imagine how many ways it would be for two particles on the right. And then 50 particles on the right and 50 particles on the left. There'd be way more ways of arranging them that way. Um, and I'm gonna do, a, I'm actually gonna do an example of this to show you this a little bit later. But my conclusion, my point here is that yes, they will equalize, you will have equal amounts on both sides. And the reason is just probability. There are more ways to arrange these particles with 50-50 than anything else. So it will end up at the most probable place. That's what will happen. OK, I'm going to get back to that example. I'm going to do a simple example with four particles, but later. Now I give you my favorite example. OK, this is my favorite example. A very young child plays in, actually, this doesn't look like it's the very young child's room. I'm talking about a really young child, like maybe a two or three-year-old. 
you know, a child that doesn't yet know that he or she should clean up their room, okay? This looks like an older sibling's room, okay? Because it's got a desk and all these books and stuff and two, two year olds don't read that. But the reason I say a very young child is because I want the, mo the motions of this child, what this child does to be kind of random. That the child is just sort of picking up things, playing at them, looking at them, putting, back, putting them back. Okay, so that's what I mean, plays in, uh, I'm going to say a room <laughs> for a while. Initially, the room is moderately neat, most objects in the proper place. What happens over time? The room, the room becomes neater with even more objects in their proper place. Okay, it's a right, kind of an absurdity, right? That's not going to happen with a kid in the room. Or the room becomes messier with more objects out of place. Which of these scenarios is more likely? Okay, well, I think that it's definitely B, okay? This is definitely what's going to happen. Um, so, so going back to how I, I tried to have you guys sort of start to think about that problem with the two, um, the two chambers connected by the valve. One way you can think about this is that there are many more ways to mess up a room than there are to neaten up a room. Okay, you could see, you know, if you have a room like this, you could you could have arranged the books maybe in a different order here, or you could move this bookshelf over here, or you could change the position of the desk, or you could take what's on this shelf and move it to that shelf. But there's a limited number of ways limited number of ways of having this room be neat. But when you think about all the possibilities of a messy room, you, 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 there are just almost an infinite number of ways that that room can be messy. I'm not going to say infinite, it's not infinite, but I'm going to say almost an infinite number of ways to make a room messy. So if a toddler is just randomly picking up objects and putting them down, it's not going to get neater. It's going to get messier. Um, so in the case of the gas molecules and the objects in the room, does entropy, does disorder increase spontaneously? The answer to that question is yes. We also think it is the most likely thing. So it seems that the most likely outcome is the one of greatest entropy. And that entropy somehow is based on probability. Okay, um, um, so let's see. So there's another thing I want to say, and that is that spreading out matter stuff. So we call stuff matter in chemistry, right? Spreading out stuff actually also spreads around energy. And if we go back to the example that I talked about a little while ago, here's our, our two, here's our chain. Suppose we have all the molecules on one side and this is just empty, okay? These guys have thermal energy. There's no thermal energy here. But if you spread the matter around, so now you have say half here and half here, now both sides have particles that are moving and that means thermal energy. So, so really when you spread matter around, which we think happens is the most likely thing to happen, right? 
um, you're also spreading energy around. This is a pretty hard topic. All right, so um, I've kind of alluded to this fact that entropy increases if there are more ways of arranging particles of a system. Um, you know, like, like the messier room, there's more ways to get a messy room than to get a neat room, so the entropy is higher. Um, what I want to do is spend just a little, a, a little bit of time looking at a very simple system. And I want to actually calculate the number of ways of getting of, of, of arranging of the particles in this system. So I'm actually going to go back to this crazy um, example of two chambers connected by an open valve. And I'm going to have four particles, only four particles. But the reason why I choose four particles is because we can actually calculate with only four particles. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, is it here? Yeah, here it is. So this is activity two. And here's my nice chamber. And, and so what I'm going to do is start by talking about um, the different ways there are of arranging molecules in this two chamber system. So I could, for example, what are all the possible combinations? I could have four molecules on the left. So I have all four in this side and that would mean there'd be none on the right, right? Well, what are the other possibilities? Well, if I had three on the left, I'd have to have one on the right, or I could have two and two, or of course I could have one and three, or all four of them on the right. Now I'm gonna call these different combinations, I'm gonna call them states. So I'm gonna call this state one. State one has all four particles on the left. State two has three and one, and then so on, three, four, and five. So now, remember, I talked about um, how there are more ways of arranging the particles if you have just one on the right, right, and 99 on the left, right? But we're going to do it with four because it's a lot easier to deal with. So here, I'm going to now talk about state four. Here's state four. State four has one particle on the left and three on the right. So what I've done here is I've actually show, draw out all the different possibilities. I label the particles one through four. If I put one on the left and three on the right, I can either put particle one on the left or particle two or particle three or particle four. And you could see that if I put one on the left and I have two, three and four left over there on the right, or if I put particle two, as you could see, there's a little pattern here. And has anybody in here ever taken statistics? Because um, there's actually a simple formula that I could have used. So I see that there are four ways of arranging particles so that one is on the left and three are on the right. But what I could have done was use this formula, four factorial over one factorial, three factorial. Has everyone ever seen that in a statistics class? Because this comes out to, you know, factorial is um, be multiplied like that. So you'd be able to cancel everything out except for the four. So there are four ways, one, two, three, and four. So the total ways for state four is four ways. Now let's think about state one. Remember state one that was where you had um, four on the left and zero on the right. And there's really only one way to get that. There's only one way. All right, what about the one where we have four on the right and zero on the left? Well, there's only one way to get that too. 
So there's one way. So, so far, state four is really winning here. There's many more ways of getting four, of getting one on the left and three on the right than there are of getting all on the left and none on the right, okay? Um, so how about if we try to do state two? Now, state two is three on the left and one on the right. So how many ways would that be? Now, if you're putting one on the right, you could either put particle one on the right or particle two or particle three or particle four, and we wouldn't need these. And of course, the ones that we didn't use on the right, they go on the left. So if we have two here, we would have three, four, and one. If we have three here, what do we have on the left? One, two, and four, right? If there's four here, then we have one, two, and three. So this is state two with three on the left and one on the right. It's really the same except in reverse as state four. All right, so there are again, four ways of doing this. So now we go up to the next step up in difficulty. This is the hardest one, right? What if we have two on the left and two on the right? So you probably have to, you have to come up with some system of doing this. So one and two on the left. What if I then I do one and three on the left and then one and four on the left. And what should I do, put, what should I put here? So now I have to start with two. So what, what, I, what could I put here? Two and to be systematic about this. I can't put two and one, I already used that one, right? So I'll put two and what? Two and three and then two and four, and that's it. I've run out of, now I have to start with three. Well, I can't put three and two, I already did that. I can't put three and one, I already did that. So it's just gonna be three and four. And then I just fill in the other particles. Three, four, two, four, two, three, one and four, one and three, one and two, and there are six ways. Okay, and I could have done that by taking four factorial over two factorial, two factorial, um, because there are two on each side. That's what causes this to be twos here. And that comes out to six. Anyway, um, so let me just put the results here, right? We had state one that was all on one side State five is the same. There's only one way of getting that. But there were four ways of getting one and three, or three and one. And then there were six ways. So what you see here is that this is the maximum. That's this state, state three, that has the even spread even spread of molecules has the most ways of getting it. So that makes it the most likely. And that's the highest entropy. Okay, that, you know, um, now it doesn't look that overwhelming. Six is not that much bigger than four, right? The, 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 it's really not that astonishingly diff different. It's pretty, you know, six and four. But the more particles, so which state is more likely would be state three, which spreads around the matter the most and has the most disorder is state three which has the highest entropy is state three, okay? That's where the system's gonna end up if there's nothing else going on, right? Um, and so I was saying that six is not overwhelmingly 
greater than four, but that's because there's only four particles. As you increase the number of particles, the 50-50 mixture becomes much, much, much more likely than anything else. So as the number of particles goes up, the 50-50 state becomes way more likely. If you have Avogadro's number, like we do in chemical systems, it's it out. It's really overwhelmingly more likely. Um, so, and and it will basically always happen, or very close to it. So, so this is kind of weird, right? Because I just spent like a month teaching you about equilibrium. And I told you that equilibrium is where systems tend to go. So I already told you that. Now I'm telling you the most likely place is where the system will go. And I'm also telling you that the state of the highest entropy is where a system will go. So how do I get these all to agree? Well, now I'm telling you, these all must be the same place. Equilibrium must be the most likely place. It must be the state of highest entropy. These all go together. Equilibrium is the state of highest entropy. It is the most likely place. That's what it is, okay? Which is really not what I've been teaching you. It's, it, it, I've never talked about this aspect of it before. And let me tell you that if you're a little confused, you have very good company because these ideas came about by a guy named Ludwig, Ludwig, yeah, Boltzmann which who lived around the turn of the century, 19, yeah, I guess this was probably in the 1890s or so that he did this work and he came up with these ideas that, that you know, thermodynamics is based on probability, that equilibrium is the most likely place to go. Um, and let me tell you that these ideas were not accepted by the scientific community In fact, Boltzmann went so far as to define entropy based on the number of ways right, you can get a certain state. So if we were talking about the system of four particles, the entropy of this state would be defined this way. He defined entropy as a constant times the natural log of W, which is the number of ways of getting a certain state. Um, yeah, so like I said, if you don't understand this then you're in good company because this was not accepted by the scientific community at the time. Um, and Boltzmann struggled with the depression and he actually committed suicide in 1906, I think it was. And I have a picture of his tombstone here to show you. <laughs> so here is, this is kind of, I'm not gonna read this to you or anything. This is a summary of what we've talked about, what I've talked about. All this is sort of a summary of what I've just said. Um, but this is this is Bolt Boltzmann's tombstone. And here, look at see what it says on here. S equals K log W. Imagine being so sure about 
your theory that you put it on your tombstone when nobody really believed you. There was very much skepticism in the scientific community at the time that this was done. Um, and uh, anyway, it's no longer that way. Now this is totally accepted. And, and actually we named this constant after him. We call it the Boltzmann constant. <laughs> so, you know, it seems like um, we should be able to use this nice formula, K log of W, that we should be able to figure out the entropy of anything we want. So can we use this nice formula S equals K log of W. He put L-O-G because everybody wrote L-O, log meant natural log back then. Can we use this nice formula to calculate entropies for our chemical systems? No, <laughs> we cannot, we absolutely cannot. And the reason is we don't have systems like four particles in two chambers connected by a valve. You know, we have carbon dioxide and water and, you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of chemicals. And, um, it, you know, the systems of chemical reaction systems are just way too complicated. My pen stopped writing. <laughs> and it's because I pushed a button. What the heck, why didn't that ever happen before? Uh, let me see if I can get this back. My pen isn't working. Oh my God, there it is. Okay, chemical reactions are too complex to use this simple formula. Okay, so we're not really in so much trouble <laughs> um, because you know, scientists have spent a lot of uh, effort, a lot of time and effort um, figuring out entropies of different things using different methods. And if you're interested in that, measuring chemistry, I'll, I'll teach you that in, um, in another course. So, so but what we can do is um, we can use these values that have been tabulated and we can when we calculate changes in entropies for reactions, we can see if it makes sense based on these ideas of disorder and ability to disperse energy. So while we can't use this simple formula, chemicals are too complex, but we can calculate delta S's in other way, in another way, really. And then at least see if it makes sense. In other words, see if the sign makes sense. See if it's sign, whether it's positive or negative, makes sense based on what we've learned about entropy and disorder. and ability to disperse energy or disperse heat. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some, some values of entropy of entropies of different materials. And I'm gonna show you how we use these values to calculate a Delta S of a reaction. So I think it's on another, um, on the next thing here. So here's us a little table, <laughs> a short list of a few different materials, a few different chemicals. These are tabulated by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, and I just wanna show you a few things here. Just notice a few things. Um, first of all, these are what we call standard entropies. 
we're familiar with standard things, standard thermodynamic quantities. If you remember from last semester, we had a standard enthalpy of formation. This referred to the delta H for taking elements in their stable forms and forming whatever compound. So for example, for HF, um, if, you, if you formed HF, you would have the delta HF zero of HF gas, okay. Um, It, it, it's very funny what this thing does. I can't get rid of this right column. <laughs> I don't know why. All right. These are not, and these are standard entropies. They are not a formation. And the, the way you know that is because delta HF zeros, if I was to put that in a column here, these would be zero. Everything that's an element would be zero. You see here that this is not equal to zero. And that's because it's, it's a standard entropy. It is not forming it from elements. It's just what it is. So, um, so these numbers are never zero. You'll notice these are all non-zero. Generally, they're all positive. Um, and that's because entropies are defined as zero at absolute zero. But that's for another day, another, another course. So I just want you to be careful that when you have an element, you will have an entropy, an entropy that's not zero. A standard entropy will not be zero like it is for heats of formation. Um, these are all for one atmosphere of pressure. If you have a solution, for example, for nitrate, this is referring to a one molar solution. And unless if not specified as otherwise, the temperature is always 298. So if I forget to write the temperature in a problem, um, I just look at Daniel's comment, right? You're right. <laughs> um, if I don't specify a temperature, it's 298, okay? Um, okay, so remember I told you that it's actually easier to solve problems than to learn all this theory. So I would really like to get into some examples. And so what I'm going to do is, is talk about this reaction. This is 2NO2 going to 1N2O4. And, and what I have here are these standard entropies. These are values that you would get from a table. And I want to calculate the delta S for this reaction. And then I want to see if that sign makes sense. Actually, if we look at this reaction, and we see we have two NO2s going to one N2O4. If I have two molecules versus having just one molecule, a larger one, which of those can spread heat around better? What do you think? You think two molecules can spread heat around better than one? If you're thinking that, then you're thinking right. Okay, when you have more gas molecules, they are able to spread around heat better than just one gas molecule. So we expect the sign of delta S for this reaction to be, to be negative because at the end, we have just one gas molecule two gas molecules can spread heat around better than one, okay? So um, let's try it. So what do we do? Well, delta S, it's a very similar formula. By the way, this is a standard enthalpy cha uh, entropy change, meaning we're doing it under standard conditions um, one atmosphere or one molar solutions. And this is equal to, okay, so it's going to be, notice here's the, here's the sort of the general formula. It's the moles, this N is moles 
That's from the stoichiometric coefficients. Okay, the moles of the products times the S0 of the products minus the moles of the reactants times S0. Here we only have um, you know, one reactant and one product, but we could have others and then you'd have to add them all up just the way we did with the delta H's back in the last semester. So let me just go through it here. So we have one mole uh, and we'd have the S0 for N2O4, so one times the S0 of N2O4 minus two times the S0 of NO2, and these are both gas. So that would be one S0 of N2O4 is 304.3 minus two times 239.9. And notice the units here. It's not kilojoules, it's joules. And notice there's a temperature in the denominator, okay? So, um, so this comes out to, what does it come out to? Negative 175.5 joules per Kelvin. Um, don't worry so much about the moles. These are each joules per Kelvin mole, but this is like one mole, so moles sort of cancels. But please don't worry about that, it's not important. So delta S0, what's important is it's joules and joules per Kelvin, not kilojoules, okay? So that's the delta S0. Um, and you, as you could see, it's negative, all right? And we expected the sign to be negative. And so that makes sense. The N2O4 is less able to dissipate heat. Okay, so okay, so now we know, so we have the delta S0 for this reaction. So my next question to you is, can we say if this reaction will be spontaneous or not? What do you think? Can we say that? Is this reaction going to be spontaneous or not? Do we know that? Let's think, of, let's go back to the second law. Okay, so what the second law says is that the change in total entropy, delta S total, must be greater than zero for spontaneity. What we know here is we know the delta S of the system. We do not know delta S total. And don't forget, we have the surroundings. Delta S total is the sum of the entropy change to the system plus the entropy change to the surroundings. And always in thermodynamics, what we do is we do not put a subscript for the system. So we would write this as delta S total is delta S plus delta S sur. And we will use the delta S zero because that's really all we can ever know uh, here. So, so we know that the delta S of the system is negative 175.5. But this, we don't know this. So we don't know what to add to it. And we don't know whether the overall will it be positive or negative. We don't know. We know that the change in entropy to the system is not helping this thing to be spontaneous because it is negative, but we don't know what the magnitude or sign of delta S total is at this point in the problem. So the next job here is to try to figure out what is delta S surroundings? Can we come up with a formula for it?
Right. So let's try to think about this. Let's try to think about delta S surroundings. So let's suppose we have a reaction here, okay? And here's my system. And I want, we need to think about heat because entropy has a lot to do with heat, heat dissipation, right? So let's suppose that we have a reaction that releases heat. So it leaves the system. So Q leaves the system and it enters the surroundings. So, so that heat comes into the surroundings. That increases the entropy of the surroundings then. If the system releases heat, so heat is leaving the system and enters the surroundings. And what happens is it gets dissipated in the surroundings. This should increase the entropy of the surroundings. And it does, it does. Um, so we, so far we think that delta S surrounding should somehow be proportional to the heat coming into the surrounding. So if this heat's coming in, it's positive, this should be positive. If heat is leaving the surroundings, then, it, then delta S should be negative. So there should be this relationship, right? Because if you're a heat, if, if the surroundings is losing heat, then it doesn't have as much heat to dissipate in the surroundings, so its entropy will be lower. All right, anyway, so this is where we start. We think it should be proportional to the heat. But now there's another aspect of this. So suppose I have two different situations here. Say it's, you know, I have my system, I have heat coming out, right? There's my heat. It's going into the surroundings. But I want to contrast these two. I'm going to make one versus the other. Let's suppose here on the left, I have a hot surroundings. <laughs> By that, I mean a high temperature. And then on the other side, I have cold surroundings. So in this case, on this side, I'm putting heat into a hot surroundings. This doesn't have a very big effect because there's already a lot of heat that's dissipated in the surroundings. So this doesn't, does not have a big effect. Why? Because the surroundings were already hot. So there was already lots of heat dissipated in the surroundings. It's kind of like if you give Jeff Bezos $20,000. He doesn't care. Okay, but if you have heat going into a cold surroundings now, this makes a big difference to the, to the heat dissipation, to heat that is dissipated. This is like giving a homeless person $20,000. Okay, it makes a big difference. So the change in entropy is greater in this situation than in this situation. So what we do is we, we say, okay, delta S surroundings, it's, it's not just proportional to the heat, but it's inversely proportional to the temperature. So if you have a higher temperature, you have a smaller delta S surroundings. 
less heat is dis less it makes less of a difference if that much heat is it's the same amount of heat but you're going to be dividing it by this so here's the relationship this is actually the formula for delta s sir if the t is greater delta s surroundings is smaller if the t is smaller delta s surroundings is greater okay and this is the amount of heat that's transferred if this is positive delta s surroundings is positive But if heat is leaving the system, heat leaving the surroundings, I mean, okay. So yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a little hard to do the theory of this, but using these formulas are actually much easier. And then you start to understand them a little bit better. So um, what is this Q, sir, anyway? So here's where you have to remember something. If you have the system over here and you have the surroundings over here and you have heat going this way, right? Then the system is losing heat. The surroundings is gaining heat. Q, surroundings, is always the negative of the system's heat, right? No subscript means system. So basically, um, Delta S surroundings, which is Q surroundings over T, is actually minus Q of the system over T. And if I then say at constant pressure, very softly, because this is freshman chemistry, then you realize that this is the negative of the Delta H. We'll put the zero there yet. So now we have a real legitimate formula that we can use. So if we calculate the delta H for the reaction, take the negative of it and divide by the temperature we've just calculated delta S, sir. And it's really hard to say, but it's easy, relatively easy to do. So I want to just do, finish that example with you. So where's the rest of this example? Oh, it's right here. Good. Except that my, I can't get rid of this thing. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh, it went away. I don't know how it did that. It just did it. Am I somewhere else? No, no. Okay. That was funny. All right. So here I am. I'm in the same problem. This is activity three, number one. We just did one A earlier. That was finding the delta S of the system. And now we're doing the next part, which is to find the delta S of the surroundings, because we want to know if this reaction is going to be spontaneous. So we have to calculate a delta H. And this is um, something that you should know how to do, or maybe some deep in your memory you may remember how to do this. And this is where, again, we use the stoichiometric coefficients of the products and reactants multiplied by their corresponding delta H F zeros. So we would say that the delta H, we'd start with, remember it's products minus reactants. So we take one mole, one times the delta H F zero of N2O4 minus two moles, because this is a two, times the delta H F zero of NO2. And that is one times 11.1 minus two times 33.2, which is minus 55.3. And this is kilojoules per mole, okay? So I've just calculated the delta H zero. And now I'm gonna use this formula. 
Delta S surroundings is the negative of that over the temperature. And all of these problems, most, most problems, the temperature will be 298, unless I tell you for the problem it's 350 or something. So I'm just going to take negative, negative 55.3, um, divided by 298, and that comes out to 0.186 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. And that is delta S sir. But now what I want to do is I want to recall like from 11A that we calculated the delta S and it was negative 175.5. It was joules per mole Kelvin. And now I have delta S sir is 0.186 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So I have to put both of these on the same footing. All right, I have to, um, it's a thousand joules per one kilojoule. So this is 186 joules per mole Kelvin. So let's put it all together here. Delta S total is delta S plus delta S sir. This is negative 175.5 joules per Kelvin mole. This is 186 So when you add these together, you get a positive number. All right, so now this is the big question. What does this tell you? Is this reaction spontaneous under standard conditions? We can only say under standard conditions because that's what we base our calculation on, numbers that come from standard conditions. So what's the answer to that question? The delta S total is positive. So what does the second law tell us? Yes, that's right, yes. This reaction is spontaneous. And actually this reaction, the delta S of the system is actually negative. So we are actually in some sense, we're creating order in the system. Why is it that we're able to do this? And we're able to do this because we're letting a, a lot of heat is coming out of the system. So if, you're, if this reaction is occurring in this flask, okay, here's your flask, okay and you've got the reaction happening in here. You've got your um, two NO2s forming one N2O4. It's not a liquid, so I guess I don't have to put a line in there. It's a bunch of gas molecules, okay? That's what's going on in here. So we're actually reducing this entropy of the system is going down. It's decreasing. Right, we have that negative 175 here. The reason why this reaction happens spontaneously is because we have a fair amount of heat comes out, coming out of the system. And what does this heat do? It heats up the surroundings and it dissipates energy in the surroundings. And if you look at the equation, you see that more energy is, more heat is dissipated in the surroundings than, um, than the negative delta S of the system. So overall, you can create some kind of order in the system if you're creating more disorder in the surroundings.
Okay, so that should explain a few things. You know, you can have reactions that have negative entropy changes um, as long as you have a greater positive entropy change in the surroundings. So chemistry is uh, full of interesting stuff. Um, and uh, that's what I have to tell you for today. So I hope that, um, hope you understood a good part of that. Um, anyway, uh, that's it. <laughs> I'll see ya. Yes, I posted, I did post another homework. I extended the homework from unit six. Um, I will be dropping two homeworks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> have a good day, everybody. Hey, Professor, I just have a question about our final. We don't uh, have do a final. We don't have a final. Do we have any more exams for this class, though? We have a fourth exam. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Oh, you're welcome about the homework. <laughs> oh, okay. Right.